Hello. Um, today I want to talk about Queen Elizabeth II. Um, if you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll know I'm from the United Kingdom. I'm British. Um, and Queen Elizabeth II is the head of state of the United Kingdom. She's also the head of state of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and numerous other countries. Um, it was 16, but I believe one of the countries in the Caribbean has had a referendum being a republic, so maybe 15 now. But she's head of state of um, a significant number of territories. Um, and anyway, today uh, is a historically significant day because as of today, she is now Britain's longest serving monarch. Um, works out at 63 years and uh, so many months. She has surpassed Queen Victoria by one day. Um, and given that she's in robust health for someone of 89, I think she's going to be on the throne for some time to come. Um, her mother lived at the age of 101, so that just puts things in context. She's not the world's longest serving monarch, I believe that goes to King Bonacol in Thailand, who was crowned in 1948, I believe, 47 or 48. Um, Queen Elizabeth II ascended to the throne when her father, King George VI, died. He was a lifelong smoker. He died of cancer in 1952 while she was on holiday in Kenya. And um, she then ascended to the throne a year later in 1953. She was crowned. That in itself was a very historical event because, for one thing, we were still going through the austerity of the post-war years. Um, so this was kind of an escape for the British people. Um, I mean, we often associate the late 40s and early 50s as being a very grey, drab time. This was still post-war austerity. Um, we were still rebuilding economically from the war. So the coronation was a bit of a distraction, along with the Great Britain exhibition of 1951. Um, also, uh, Hillary and um, Tenzing Norgay climbing Everest that year. So 53 in some ways um, was seen in many ways as a positive year. Um, Although there was a negative side to it as well, I might uh, just point out that that year was a great storm which caused devastation in the Netherlands and in southeast England. Um, in many ways, it's been called the forgotten tragedy because people just didn't want to think about a tragedy at a time of this glimmer of optimism. Um, the Queen ascended the throne at the age of 26, so this is, when you think about it, an enormous mantle to take on at the age of 26 to be sovereign of at that time 400 million people um obviously uh this came at a radical time of the decolonization period so many countries that were part of the british empire the british empire still was in its last vestiges at that time but technically the british empire didn't end until 1997 with the handover of hong kong but in the 50s and 60s it was a very significant period of decolonization. Um, our Prime Minister at the time, Harold Macmillan, summed it up with his famous winds of change speech. Um, countries like Kenya, Tanzania, Nigeria, all got their independence around that time. Um, the historian David Starkey has summed it up, and he's a controversial figure because he tends to be quite outspoken and he's not always the most diplomatic of historians, but he has said she may be the first and only monarch to be titled head of the Commonwealth. Um, she has presided over a period of decolonization, so she can't be styled empress for obvious reasons. Um, India, Pakistan are independent countries. Um, so unlike her father and grandfather and great grandmother in Queen Victoria, she's never been styled empress. Um, she may be the first and only monarch to be styled head of the Commonwealth. Now, depending on the country, there's different, um, I'll talk about the UK in a minute, but looking at the Commonwealth countries, support for the monarchy in Canada and Australia is still quite strong. Uh, I've seen opinion polls that tend to be around the 70% mark. So it's still generally quite strong. There have been some Australian premiers. I know Malcolm Fraser, for example, the late Malcolm Fraser was a staunch Republican. Uh, unless I'm mistaken. And um, I think in Canadian politics, unless I'm mistaken, John Crescian was a Republican. 
Um, but they've always been diplomatic about it. They've always sort of said they believe in republicanism, but they respect the Queen. I remember in 1975, there was a constitutional crisis in Australia when uh, Malcolm Fraser took over from the also late Gough Whitman. And um, there was a controversy at that time whereby the um, High Commissioner for Australia, which is sort of like the Queen's representative, uh, temporarily had precedent over the Australian Prime Minister, and that caused a big controversy. Um, I totally understand that. If I was Australian, I would feel quite with that situation. Um, so uh, that's the situation as it seems to be in, in countries like Canada, Australia. I'm not so sure what the situation is in New Zealand, but I would say it would echo those countries. Um, I know that some of the Caribbean countries have pondered on whether or not to be independent states. I think Jamaica is one of the latest to ponder on that. I mean, obviously they're independent states, but I mean to be republics uh, and not have the Queen as, as head of state. Um, looking at the Commonwealth situation, um, I think it's fair to say the United Kingdom is still very much seen as the mother nation because it is. The Commonwealth of Nations is pretty much the the former British Empire. Um, and without wanting to sound egotistical, it's simply a fact that the United Kingdom is the mother nation. Now, how that is perceived in Commonwealth nations, I don't know. Um, one thing that is interesting is whilst the British government tends to be controversial abroad for a range of reasons, um, the Queen tends to be held in very high regard. In fact, sometimes much higher regard than she is held in Britain itself. Um, and this is something I'll, I'll get to in a minute. But first of all, I'll talk about the significance of this Queen in the United Kingdom. Generally speaking, she maintains quite high popularity, and for the most part, that tends to be higher than her prime ministers. This queen has seen 12 prime ministers from Churchill. In fact, I'll just go through them all, um, just to put things in context. Churchill, uh, Attlee, um, actually, in order, it would be Attlee, Churchill, Attlee? No, Churchill, Macmillan. Eden, or sorry, Churchill, Eden, Macmillan, uh, Wilson, um, Douglas Home, Wilson, um, Heath, Callahan, Thatcher, Major, Blair, Brown, and Cameron. Um, I may be unintentionally omitting someone there. And um, 12 American presidents from either Truman, I'm not sure which month uh, Truman stepped down. Uh, from Truman to Obama, uh, seven popes. Um, I believe it was Pius VI when she was crowned until obviously Pope Francis now. Um, I'm not sure how many Russian presidents, uh, numerous German chancellors, French presidents. Euronews today had this little uh, montage of all the world leaders that have come and gone in the time that she has been monarch. Now, that shouldn't necessarily be seen as sort of British vanity, like, oh, look how long our leader has been in power. It's worth noting that she's not elected. She's a head of state, but she isn't elected. So a lot of people have pointed out that, that the, it's true those leaders were in for a much shorter period, but they were to a large extent elected. That's not universal. I mean, you get the likes of Chairman Mao and Fidel Castro, who um, came and went within her her time in office. Um, the world in 1952 was obviously a very different place. It was in the midst of the Cold War. Um, the power of the media was very, very different in the sense that basically until the 60s, um, scandals were very much toned down. And, you know, it took the 60s and 70s, like Watergate, the Kennedy assassination and so on, that really, really changed the platform of the media. Um, the power of the British press today is immense. Um, we have had tabloids, the power of the tabloid press, since they can be traced roughly to the 1890s and the 1910s. But really, uh, I mean, the sun was launched in 1966. And it's only since then that the, they have had the sort of power that they have had, which has meant that any politician or any member of the royal family that has had any 
scandal, no matter how small or how big, has been absolutely pilloried by the tabloids. Um, and they're utterly ruthless. So that's been one of the most striking things about her reign is the, the growth of the, the power of the press. Also, the digital age, the space age, the um, the internet, you name it. She is the monarch for, for the modern uh, period. Um, to what extent she herself as a modern monarch is open for debate, but certainly Prince Charles and and her grandchildren, William and Harry, are definitely modern royals in the sense that they're very much in touch, especially William and Harry. Um, Diana, of course, is another story that's, you know, it's been one of those things that's been, there's so many conspiracy theories out there, there's so many ins and outs about, perceive it how you will. Um, in 1997, that was one of the rare occasions when the Queen's popularity plummeted and she had popularity at 50%, even 45%. Um, because of her handling of Diana's death, many people thought she was cold and out of touch. Um, today, obviously, there is something like 35 monarchies around the world. There's a few others in Europe, Spain, Sweden, the Netherlands, a um, few others in other parts of the world in the Middle East. Um, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Southeast Asia, Cambodia, and Thailand. Um, I've I've been quite outspoken about the situation in Thailand, and it's quite, although it's a constitution and monarch, it's a very different situation there. And one thing that is, I mean, I'm mentioning Thailand because that is the only monarchy that is surpassing our own. King Burma Paul has been king for 68 years. Um, however, in Thailand, they have very strict les majesty laws. In Britain, we really value freedom of expression. Um, Thai monarchists, if they come to Britain, they will be shocked at the amount of satire that is available, for example, ridiculing the royal family. Um, this is in light of the fact that, uh, or at least in the context, that the, the British royal family actually is quite popular anyway. Um, but the point is, in the United Kingdom, you're not going to be arrested for offending the monarchy. And I think that's a very good thing. If if that was the case, if we had Les Majesté laws, I would become a Republican tomorrow because I think that's just completely uh, unacceptable in the modern world. But, um, you know, you cannot have democracy without free expression. Now, over the years, I the first thing I'll say is it, purely in terms of culturally speaking and purely in terms of history, I am interested in the monarchy. Um, simply because they, they are a very big part of our history. Now, provided the light is not too bad, I'm going to show you a little collection I have. Um, I tend to collect the uh, antiques. Um, these up in charity shops. Um, those ones happen to be coronation mugs from her grandfather. Um, we have something called the Royal Mint, whereby you can buy specially crafted coins to celebrate famous people, to celebrate royal occasions. So, for example, there'll be a coin to commemorate this. Um, there was a coin for her Diamond Jubilee, which marks 60 years on the throne. Just to put things in context, Elizabeth II is now the longest reigning monarch, and by far the oldest. Queen Victoria was the second longest reigning monarch, and she was 81 when she passed away. King George III, 59 years. Uh, to my American viewers, that is the King George, who is um, obviously a controversial figure in American history. Um, but we had two other, actually we have, George is a very common monarch's name. Um, uh, fourth longest serving, I believe, was Henry III, who, although he was the fourth longest serving monarch, was not a particularly well-remembered monarch. Uh, he was king way back in the 13th century. Um, four, sorry, fifth, I believe, was Edward III, who is known as the Black Prince and who is associated with, for example, the Black Death. Um, I think he's known as the Black Prince. I may be wrong about that. That may be another Edward. But anyway, Edward III. Um, if you're wondering about famous monarchs, Henry VIII ranks about eighth in terms of his reign. Uh, Elizabeth I is about seventh, something like that. Um, so they're some of our more famous monarchs. Um, like I say, I think this queen is going to be on the throne for a while yet. And I don't think this is ever going to be surpassed. 
because I do believe that in the coming years, we're going to see the, the monarchy as an institution seriously tested. I personally like Charles, actually. I think he's a good man. I think he has a conscience. I think he's done a lot of work with the environment and with raising conservation issues. I think he's an intelligent and cultured man. Um, I think he would be a good king. I think he'd be very much like his grandfather, um, George VI. I definitely see personality traits that are similar between them. And William, of course, is a very modern royal. He's very much in touch with young people and so on. But I still think that the monarchy is going to be very tested. We're not going to see a monarch like this, maybe never again. This queen, I think, is going to be better remembered than... Uh, I think she is going to be among the more famous monarchs simply because of her longevity on the throne. And in the sense that she is a perfect constitutional monarch, what I mean by that is the whole point of a constitutional monarchy is that a king or queen is head of state but has minimal influence on politics. Now, by convention, the queen is not allowed to interfere in politics. She cannot take sides. Whoever is prime minister has weekly meetings. And when he or she um, wins an election, that is, whoever is uh, the leader of a party, if their party gets the most votes, he or she has the right to be prime minister. Um, now, the Queen will get weekly updates. And obviously, if there was a major situation going on, for example, if we were about to go to war or if there was a major national crisis, of course, she will want to be updated. But by and large, she cannot um, have... You know, her influence on politics is limited. I won't say it's non-existent. That would be wrong to say that it's non-existent, but it is limited. Um, I'm just going to make a few quick points about my own feelings about the monarchy as it stands. Like I say, purely on a cultural basis, I'm, I'm quite interested. And, you know, I'd be a hypocrite if I said I was like against the monarchy because, you know, I have royal merchandise. Um, and But that's more for history reasons. It's not like a a blind adulation. I don't love the Queen. It's more just that I'm interested in history and these artifacts are historically significant. Um, how long will the monarchy last? I, I really don't know. I think we're going to have serious questions in the coming years. Obviously there's the issue of Scottish independence. That is going to be raised again inevitably now that the SNP, in my opinion, unfortunately has got the number of seats they have. I think that's terrible because I... I believe the SNP just want to break up this country. And uh, I, really, uh, I have total contempt for what they're trying to do. And I think it's a tragedy if that happens. But inevitably, these issues are going to be brought up. Inevitably, there is going to be calls for a second referendum. I don't think that should happen, simply because in the last referendum, Alex Salmon said there wouldn't be. And unless there is a strong demand from the Scottish people for a second referendum, then you know, I really do believe that people voted for the SNP. And to my international viewers, this is, stands for Scottish National Party. They're a separatist party. Um, you know, imagine Basque separatists or, um, you know, that, that's the sort of um, party we're talking about. But basically, I would say the only call for that would be if there's a clear mandate from the Scottish people for a second referendum. And I'll make another video about that at the time. But all of these things are going to bring about issues. Now, I've mixed opinions on what this would do for us in the world. The rest of the world tends to look at Britain as, and they, they think of her queen, they think of the British monarchy. I mean, she's unquestionably not only one of the most famous women in the world today, but I think it's fair to say over the last 50 years. Um, you know, she's way up there among the most famous women of the later 20th century. She's among the most photographed women. She's almost certainly the most travelled head of state. Um, she's been to made 295 official visits. Um, that's not including repeat visits. Um, so she's extremely widely travelled. Uh, obviously, she's had the less than that because of her age. Um I do think it would be very difficult for the rest of the world to see Britain not being in a monarchy, to see a Republic of Britain. And even many Britons would find that very hard to see, even if it was the right thing. And even if it was something that we, even if that was an approach we weren't down, it would be, it would take a very long time for us to adjust. You know, you don't have a thousand years of monarchy 
and then suddenly, I, I'm saying a thousand years, that's only since our respective home nations have been unified. England's been a united um, kingdom for since about 927. That's not even including the various petty kingdoms before that. So the truth is, this country's never been a republic. There was one very brief period from uh, 1649 to 1660 um, when we were a republic just after the English Civil War. But that's largely remembered as a time of tyranny. Um, now, maybe it's unfair to judge republicanism based on that one period. I, I'm personally of the view whereby I'm more, much more sympathetic to republicanism than I was a few years ago. Why? Because I think that the fundamental argument is right. That is that fundamentally the Queen as head of state is born into that position. She's not elected. And they make the argument that this is fundamentally goes against the very principle of democracy. Now, it's very hard to argue against that. It's true that the Queen doesn't have much political power, hence we can't call her a dictator. I, I will say one thing, when Republicans, hardcore Republicans, make vitriolic hateful statements. Um, I don't think that helps the case. So when they say, say things like they hope the Queen dies and this sort of thing, I don't think they're helping their argument. Um, as for her being a lazy scrounger, this is, uh, you know, for a woman of her age, she's very tireless in terms of her official duties. So I think that's unfair. Um, in terms of the royals doing nothing, well, um, it's true they, they don't pass legislation, but to say that they do nothing, I think, is a bit unfair. They have played an enormous role, for example, in the arts, in, in terms of uh, our cultural heritage. I think that um, to simply dismiss that and to dismiss a thousand years of royalty, you know, some Republicans really need to understand how they come across. I think that they have some very valid arguments, but I think there is a way to make those arguments without being vitriolic. And that sort of attitude is just as bad as some royalists who are, frankly, just blindly adulating. I, I like to think I'm neutral uh, in terms of my approach to this. Although right now I'm probably, put it this way, I'm interested in terms of a cultural perspective, in terms of the, the role that's played in our history. But in terms of actual solid arguments, Two years ago, I would have made, been making arguments for the monarchy. Now, I'm wondering if maybe it is time that we consider that we become a republic. It's, it would be a totally radical position to take. And my only reservation about it would be, would it decrease our influence in the world? Because the world looks at Britain. And I think they respect our role as a powerful constitutional monarchy. So if we suddenly became a republic, would we have the same respect? That's a matter of debate. Um, and who would be the first British president? I mean, there's a million questions to ask about this. Um, in terms of, like I say, the separatist issues, Scottish, potentially Welsh nationalism, Northern Ireland's role in the future. These are all very important questions. Uh, when I think about this country over the next 10 years, I feel somewhat anxious. I feel anxious about the future of our framework as the United Kingdom, but also in terms of just politics generally. If, as seems very likely, Jeremy Corbyn is elected leader of the Labour Party, we're going to have a situation where we have the hard left versus the hard right in government. I think we're going to see a repeat of the 1980s, and I'm very concerned about that. Anyway, um, this video has been running on for a while now. Um, this, is, uh, this is a historic day. You know, the Queen has, uh, has now reached a milestone, and I think she's going to be around for a while. She's unquestionably the world's most famous monarch. Um, I guess King Salman might be second. Um, most famous, but you know, uh, and I'm not saying that from an egotistical point of view, and I don't want people to think this is British arrogance. I think it's just quite obvious. She's known all over the world. Um, my international viewers, if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask. If you have any opinions, 
you know, I'm not going to be offended by anything. Like I say, this is not Thailand. We we are generally don't take ourselves too seriously. You will find some British royalists are quite uptight about it. Um, I think we what we can't do is dismiss the role that the monarchy has played in this country. It is absolutely profound. And Republicans have to accept that, that if we were to have a British Republic, what I would say is we can never, ever trivialise and gloss over the role the monarchy has played. And they would have to do it in a fair way. So, for example, by all means, make arguments for a republic, but don't just demonise kings and queens. That's not, it's not fair. And I don't think it wins support. Um, until the Glorious Revolution in 1688, we had absolute monarchs. They were essentially dictators um, through a long evolution of democratic processes. We are now a constitutional monarchy. At the moment, I don't see any radical need to change to a republic. But what I am saying is there may be serious scope for asking this question in the next 10 years. So long as Queen Elizabeth II is monarch, I don't think that is necessary. But I do think this is going to be an issue in the next 10 years. So uh, I've spoken for quite a long time in this video. Um, as for my British viewers, um, if you're a Republican, feel free to voice your views. But I would ask that you're objective and you don't just make a rant about, oh, they're, they're benefit scroungers and this sort of thing, because that's not fair. Um, and it isn't going to win support with the wider public, because in the end of the day, her support still is around 65, 70 percent. Um, as a royalist, again, you need to understand and listen to Republicans, not simply dismiss them as traitors and other absurd claims. Basically, what I'm saying is both sides need to have a civil conversation about this, because these questions are going to be raised. And goodness knows the last thing we need as a country is yet more bitter division the way Scottish nationalism has caused. Um, you know, I, I understand both sides. I'm at the moment slightly more sympathetic to the Republican argument, but you know I'm not massively enthusiastic about it. It's something that we re really need to reflect carefully on and think about all the issues. Um, okay, thank you for watching.